Now, each of you um, kind of took us transnationally, and most of us who were teaching at, I think, almost every level, primary tertiary, uh, uh, secondary tertiary in, uh, in the United States are dealing with issues of global society, globalization, transnationalism. Um, and so that, uh, I would like us to think about um, the study of philanthropy and not-for-profits and civil society in this century. Uh, how, is the, uh, how, are, uh, how is graduate research on philanthropy and not-for-profits and civil society? Cultural policy going to be nudged in, uh, in the next few years? What, what are the emerging trends? What should we be paying attention to? How should we, I mean, uh, in a few minutes, let's be talking about how we prepare and enga engage our students. But before we do that, we have to really, as scholars, think about what are the emerging trends and, and uh, forces of change that you, would, you are thinking about. Well, I, I, I think it's safe to say that since at least 1989 and perhaps a bit earlier, definitely a bit earlier, um, as uh, the movements to erode uh, Soviet authority in Central and Eastern Europe got off the ground, um, actually a new term. Uh, or an old term, was reintroduced uh, to American, Anglo-American discourse, namely civil society. Civil. The old Scottish Enlightenment term, the old term uh, that uh, I suppose political theorists would have used in, in um, the late 18th, early 19th century, um, was not a part of our discourse, but with the work of Havel in Poland, of, of, of uh, Mishnik, of, uh, sorry, I got that wrong, of, well, of, of Walesa in Poland, of Havel in, in Czechoslovakia. Um, we began to realize that there was a space opening up in these regimes, whether mm -hmm. through the church, the Catholic Church in Poland, uh, the labor movement, uh, through the cultural work in the Czech Republic, uh, the Baltic states also had their cultural and uh, historical groups. The term that they use to describe these movements and, and these rudimentary organizations to challenge the state, the term was civil society. Um, we then, I think, saw as, uh, as the wall came down, as, uh, as we saw uh, the Soviet republics become independent states. Um, the democracy assistance programs that uh, many of the Western foundations uh, uh, set up, um, the indigenous organizations that were springing up, led some scholars to realize that there was a kind of global civil society revolution. Mm. And the proliferation of organizations I think has led us in the U.S. And, and in the West more generally to ask questions about the role that civil society is playing, mm -hmm. not only in Central and Eastern Europe, but in Latin America and, uh, and, and in our own country. Mm -hmm. um, so this global awareness of civil society um, is, is relatively recent, uh, a phenomenon of, of the last 25 or 30 years. And it has generated um, much new scholarship um, and a lot of research uh, in, in universities, uh, new research centers springing up in, in Europe and, and other parts of, uh, of the world. Uh, one, one dimension of that work has to do with the legal frameworks under which non-government organizations operate in different parts of the world. The, the American framework has traditionally been, and since the Civil Rights Movement is more so, the, the most welcoming. Um, the, there are uh, uh, countries with other legal traditions that uh, have different, where the law takes a different view of the legitimacy of 
organizations outside the state. And, and then there are political cultures in different uh, parts of the world as well. So there's both the study of those differences and people who work within particular traditions naturally think the tradition that, that they approve of is, ought to be more widely accepted. Mm -hmm. And so there, there, there is a good deal of advocacy that there should be more state control or less state control, there should be limits as to what one can do. Or So one of my uh, own students has, has worked a good, great deal on non-government organizations in China. And some people think that's a, that can't even be a possibility. But she argues that the Chinese Communist Party has come to realize that there are many things that cannot be centrally controlled and there's resources that cannot be most effectively mobilized by the party and so then the question is well what are the limits mm -hmm. of this kind of activity um, and it's a very complicated set of questions and and but but in fact it's a it's a quite a lively debate in China so mm -hmm. that's that's one kind of topic and then people from outside China look at it and mm -hmm. some of them say to my student, you're exaggerating the degrees of freedom or you're starting with a notion from the Cultural Revolution period and come on, that's a really extreme position to start with. But then there's the response is this is really very complicated. It, it, it's interesting to think of, of China as early as 1987 and this uh, during a time when I was not in the academy but in the foundation world, mm -hmm. I was meeting with young Chinese lawyers from their Ministry of Civil Affairs who were asking pre Tiananmen right. whether they could revise their civil code in order to open up a space for nonprofit organizations in China. Um, in the early and mid 1990s, there were actually delegations sent by the Ministry of Civil Affairs and other Chinese ministries to study the nonprofit sector in the States. And we set up, uh, we, the foundation I was working for, training programs mm. for nonprofit executives in China. And they were looking for American models that would be transplantable to a Chinese context. And interestingly, they found community foundations and uh, entities like the United Way, the easiest mm -hmm. way to capture modest resources uh, for social needs that they felt were not being met. To, to see the birth of civil society in China, to see a civil law system trying to crank open the spaces for civil society has been quite a remarkable thing over the last 20 years. And my guess is one thing that made those work is there's a uh, one element of the tradition of American community, some American community foundations and United Way, community chest kind of approach is is that the some of the board that governs those organizations in the U.S. is often appointed by the mayor or a federal judge in the district. So there's a, there's a a direct hand of the authority of government in these or entities which nonetheless mobilize voluntary effort for community service. So that fits, that's an American mm. invention. Um, Very practical. By, by, by actually, by, largely by Republicans in Cleveland, Ohio, <laughs> in the, around the time of World War I, uh, that works comfortably with, mm. with, fits some of the needs of the institutional and political realities in China uh, at the moment. So I, it's not and, surprising. And, and the Community Foundation uh, movement is also quite robust in Western Europe now, too. Um, it, um, it seems to be a mechanism, again, where the resources are fairly modest, mm -hmm. which Frederick Goff and others in Cleveland knew they would be, um, can come together around local community needs. Mm -hmm. 